Our next speaker grew up in western Colorado, hiking, backpacking, hunting, and fishing in the forests he now studies. Dr. William Andreg's research focuses on western U.S. forests and climate change. He, receives, he received his Ph.D. from the Department of Biology at Stanford University and worked as a NOAA Climate and Global Change Postdoctoral Fellow at Princeton U University. He is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Utah. Let us all welcome Dr. Andreg. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm quite excited to be here and to listen to a lot of these talks today. Uh, I'm Bill Andreg. I'm at the University of Utah. And I want to talk today about drought, and in particular, something that's near and dear to my heart and probably a lot of our hearts, uh, what happens to forests during severe drought. So first, we'll just do a, a very brief background and context about some of the stresses that forests are likely to face in a changing climate. Uh, and then I'll talk about the physiology of how trees get stressed and die during drought and what we know and don't know and some of the ways we've been thinking about that. Uh, I want to dwell a little bit on where are we in terms of prediction. That if a, a drought happens this next summer, uh, what can we say? Can we make any predictions uh, either at a, a yearly or even going forward decades um, this century? And finally, talk about some of the really promising future directions that I see. So, of course, the context as was really nicely laid out by the, the previous speaker is that we've seen this rather rapid warming of the planet and driven by greenhouse gases emitted by humans. And, of course, plants are situated in this tug of war and that some of these changes, like rising CO2 concentrations, can be beneficial and others, particularly temperature and drought stress, can be harmful. And... Uh, the balance of these two and how these two interact with a whole suite of other factors is really uh, a difficult systems level challenge. So here's, here's the Amazon on a, a sunny uh, morning. And what we're pri primarily concerned about is, and especially here in the West, is hydroclimate stress, so drought stress. Here's one of our, our lakes, and this was kind of nicely captured also uh, by the previous speaker. The, the future picture does not look so rosy in terms of drought stress. So this is a, a synthesis of about 11 of the current climate models, and this top picture is again soil moisture. Uh, red colors are showing us here declines in soil moisture, uh, and this bottom one is the Palmer Drought Severity Index. Uh, again, negative numbers and red colors being more drought stress. Uh, this is for the two decades at the end of the century, 2080 to 2100, in the high emissions, high carbon scenario. Of course, here we are in the western U.S. in pretty much a, a bullseye zone of drying out. Uh, and this is a fairly robust pattern across a lot of climate models. The dots mean that nine out of the 11 models here agree. Now, in response to relatively moderate climate changes that we've seen in the past one or two, three decades, we've started to see instances of widespread regional scale forest mortality. Uh, these are lodgepole pines in British Columbia. And uh, Craig Allen and a, a group of folks pulled together a, a summary of what we know globally so far. Uh, this is an update that I helped Craig do in the, the latest IPCC report. And every dot on this map is a study a study of, that documents regional scale tree mortality uh, attributed or linked in some way to temperature and drought stress. Uh, the, the white dots are more recent study. I, yes, the white dots are more recent studies and the polygons are large uh, plot networks of, of thousands of plots that, that don't fit nicely into a single dot. So we've seen them on every continent and in wet and dry ecosystems. Now, what this doesn't tell us is it doesn't tell us anything about a trend. We unfortunately don't right now have the data sets to have a sense of whether mortality is increasing or decreasing uh, in most ecosystems in the world, but there's a large cause for concern. We've seen a lot of these events, uh, and in some areas, like the western U.S., we do have the data sets and we do see increasing trends in tree mortality. Here's snapshots from around the West in different tree species. Uh, I've focused a lot on aspen mortality. We also have pinyon pines, and, and several of these were triggered by the early 2000s drought here, 2000 to 2003. 
Why should we care? Well, it's, this is probably pretty obvious to a lot of folks in this room, but of course when trees die off, we're going to have this cascade of effects that ripple through the ecological community, affecting things like invasive species, understory plants, uh, the biodiversity and species present in these ecosystems. This should also affect the ecosystem processes, things like nutrient cycling, uh, runoff, fire, although many of these effects are fairly complex and, and not uh, easy to predict right off the bat. And again, this affects the ecosystem goods and services provided to humanity. Uh, this is a, a nice study that quantified the drop in land values and property values as the forest died off around folks in Colorado. And of course, all of this can and will scale up to regional and global scale climate. That forests currently are fairly large carbon sinks. They take up about a quarter of the human emissions of CO2 every year. But uh, tree mortality and, and in particular loss of forests is a double-edged sword. Not only are, or is, a, is a double whammy. Not only do we lose that carbon uptake, but they also start to emit that carbon back to the atmosphere as they decompose. And of course, one of the big unknowns is what's going to be the future of terrestrial ecosystems going forward. Uh, so I'll walk you through this graph, but what's shown here is the, the simulations of global ecosystems carbon uptake. So we're showing you the carbon flux and petagrams of carbon per year. And a positive flux means that the land, this is global ecosystems, uh, is taking up carbon. So this is where, where we are at today, that we're taking up on the order of about two petagrams of carbon per year. Now, if you look at this, um, I think of this a little bit like a spaghetti cannon, that over the observed record, these models agree relatively well about how the global ecosystems have, have changed over the past century and a half. And then starting about in today, they diverge massively. So by the end of the century, our predictions of, of global ecosystems uh, really don't agree, that they span anywhere from on the order of a 10 petagram a year carbon sink, which is about current emissions, current human emissions, to a six petagram a year source. So that's a, a huge loss of carbon to the atmosphere and will greatly accelerate the speed of climate change. So a lot of the motivation for my work and for others' work is try to understand the processes that drive forest dynamics in response to climate uh, and, and really try to understand which of these futures is more plausible and which of these futures are we headed on. Uh, of course, a, a huge piece of this is also how much climate change occurs and how much, human, how much we uh, work to slow climate change. Obviously, the low emission scenarios, you have a much smaller spread and uh, much less uncertainty. And the high emission scenarios, there's a lot of wild cards that we might not know about. So let's, let's zoom in now to the, the physiology of tree stress. And uh, this is a really interesting and a, a really exciting area. And it's been of interest to ecologists and foresters for quite a long time. Uh, this is, I think, a, a nice quote uh, from Manayan in the, the 80s. And it's about forest decline as a popular topic in the 1980s. And forest and tree decline was likewise a popular topic 20 to 30 years ago. Um, now, of course, these are potentially somewhat different drivers in, in the focus of these studies, but we're still curious about when do abiotic conditions tend to trigger tree decline and tree mortality. And there's, there's been a, a lot of frameworks and concepts introduced in the um, older literature of these spirals of decline, that you have, uh, you have predisposing factors that set trees up to die, you have inciting factors that actually trigger it, uh, and you have certain po possibilities of recovery and pulling out of this spiral at different standpoints. Um, one just fantastic quote that I, I think is still incredibly relevant today about tree mortality comes from a, a paper by Jerry Franklin in 1987, where he says, tree death is so commonplace that the casual observer might logically assume it to be well understood to biologists. But overall, the, the patterns and causes of tree death typically are complex, and we are only beginning to appreciate the complexities. Uh, and I, it's, it, it just it rings uh, very true even now, 30 years later. So there's been a renewed focus on the physiology of how trees die, uh, really following this early 2000s drought. Uh, Nate McDell and a group of folks got together and, and proposed some uh, two, two uh, overlapping pathways 
trying to dive into the physiology of what might fail in a tree. Uh, now the, the basic context for this, right, is that trees are poised between this dry soil and this even drier atmosphere. And they have to pull the water from the soil up to their leaves to stay hydrated and do photosynthesis. So all this water moving through a tree is under tension. Now the idea behind this first pathway that they put forward is eventually as this tension rises during drought, the soil is getting dry and the atmosphere is getting even drier, eventually these water columns start to break. Tiny air bubbles called embolisms or cavitation shoot into the cells and interrupt this water transport. Uh, this is what happens to your house plants largely if you don't water them for a, a week or two. Uh, and this they, they call it hydraulic failure. It's this loss of the water transport system, the hydraulic system in the plant. Uh, incidentally, you can actually hear some of this process, the embolism with a very fine um, microphone. If you stick a, a microphone up to a tree on a hot summer day, you can start to hear little pops and pings as these uh, water columns break and air bubbles shoot into the cells. And they posited that there might be an alternate scenario in which some plants are good enough at shutting down their water loss. So they're closing the pores on their leaves through which they lose water. Uh, these pores are called stomata. And they're event essentially able to avoid some of this hydraulic failure, but the risk is that they're now not doing photosynthesis and relying on stored reserves. So they could eventually run out of these food reserves, uh, primarily non-structural carbohydrates in trees. So these are the, these two um, overlapping and, and non-mutually exclusive hypotheses that these folks put forward that's, that's really um, triggered a lot of research since then. Uh, one thing that's worth mentioning is, is they really hypothesize that um, these should be tightly linked to a tree's strategy of its stomata, that in, in general species with fairly risk-taking stomata, so stomata that stay open during drought and dry conditions, uh, generally it's a, called anisohydry, should be more at risk of hydraulic failure, and those with for more conservative and, and shutting those, their stomata earlier should be more at risk of carbon starvation. Well, we have a lot of data to test this, or some data to test this now. Uh, primarily, people test hydraulic failure as a change in the percent loss hydraulic conductivity. So that's how blocked these uh, xylem cells are by air. And they look at carbon starvation by declines in the non-structural carbohydrates. Uh, I've been part of this synthesis paper that's in review where we put together all the experiments and observations uh, across 26 species. And the the really kind of rough first estimate is that loss of hydraulic transport is ubiquitous, that in every tree that we, that we measure that has died, you tend to see a lot of this loss of hydraulic transport. And the changes in plant carbon status, at least through carbohydrates, are a lot more mixed, that you see some declines that are slightly more prevalent in gymnosperms, generally uh, less prevalent or, or absent in angiosperms. Uh, so that, that's, that's the framework that's been tested a lot in the past couple years. Um, but it's, I want to take a step back and, and really acknowledge that um, it's widely considered that these two hypotheses are probably oversimplifications uh, in that the real physiology is, is a lot more complex than this and we're going to dig into this. And I'm going to actually argue that they're not necessarily that useful anymore. And the primary reason is we haven't been able to find thresholds that if you want to predict something going forward into the future, we see relatively few thresholds. Um, that it's very hard to test this carbon starvation hypothesis because we don't really understand the roles of carbohydrates and how they move, when they can be used and when they can't be used. And even if you see a decline in carbohydrates, you don't actually know if that's harmful to the plant uh, because we don't really know what the harmful levels are, what's kind of normal variability. And finally, I, I think we've been realizing that this, this stomatal strategy of, of isohydry and anisohydry, risky to conservative stomata, is probably not the main axis of variation in mortality. Uh, and we're going to come back to that a little bit later in the talk. Just to give you an example, this is, this is from this paper showing these two variables. Here is the percent loss hydraulic conductivity. So zero means perfectly transporting. 100 means no transport at all through this water transport system, through the xylem. And this is the carbohydrate deviation from control. So these to the right here are declines in carbohydrate concentration. So there's a lot of trees that are dying that have a loss of hydraulic uh, transport. And there are some trees that are over in these declines in carbohydrate storage. Uh, so this is 
supports that, that main finding of the paper I mentioned. But what I want to highlight as a, an indication of why I think this framework is not necessarily getting us as far as we would like is that if you look at a single species, so these are all studies on this, but a single species actually covers the entire range of this spectrum. So pinion pine uh, really spans the entire range from no carbohydrate changes all the way down. And when a, a single species can cover our whole framework, it's not necessarily going to be helpful in trying to distinguish among species or among populations. So what I'm going to propose actually is a little bit more of a step back to the older frameworks in that we think about tree mortality as this spiral of interrelated system failures, that a tree is also a complex, dynamic, and nonlinear system. And there's this web of factors that take a precipitation deficit into a soil moisture deficit, mediated by landscape at different scales and also by the species present. And then there's a, a set of physiology and species level traits that translate this into plant water stress. Uh, and again, you have a lot of community level factors about where uh, water comes from, how much plants are competing for water, and of course the soils as well. And then eventually this physiology damage, physiological damage, which we posit plays out primarily through this water transport system. We do have evidence that there's a lot of embolism in these, these bubbles that shoot in and interrupt water transport. And eventually we're trying to, to isolate some sort of physiological threshold that we can use to predict. Um, I think a, actually a, a nice analogy comes from a really famous chart in history. So this is what's called the Sankey diagram and it's uh, the width of the, these bars is, is proportional to the size of a, a, a given flux. In this case, troops, soldiers. So this is Napoleon's march into Russia, right? A famous, famous event in history. He leaves and slowly his army dwindles down by the time he gets to Moscow. It's unsuccessful coming back and by the end his, his army is reduced to, to shambles. There's nothing left of his army. Uh, and I'm going to posit that actually this, it's a whole series of complex failures. You see troops leave and there's kind of attrition along the way and this is showing you the actual temperature on the way back, how it just plummets on the way back so troops are freezing and starving. Um, and I, I, I'm going to posit that this actually, this accumulated decline uh, is, a, is a useful way in thinking about tree mortality during drought. And it's actually what we've been studying in uh, aspen mortality in Colorado. And so we've done a, a suite of studies, but what's interesting about aspen mortality, this is sudden aspen decline that I've been working on, is that a lot, the vast majority of these trees don't die during the drought. They tend to die between three and even eight or nine years later. Uh, so what this tells us is that the drought really sets this off, right? It's the inciting factor that, that triggers this mortality, but a whole lot happens between when the drought ends and when the tree dies. And some trees do uh, probably are able to recover. So what we found was, yes, initially when you drought trees, they have this large hydraulic loss. So this is our, our Sankey diagram here of hydraulic capacity. We'll think of it as how well a given stem or a given tree can pipe water. Uh, and so during, so blue is the actual hydraulic capacity and red is this losses area. So you have some amount of loss, probably a fairly large loss during the drought itself, but for most plants, it's not, most aspen trees, it's not lethal. Uh, you see declines in growth following drought. So these trees seem to not be able to grow new xylem in subsequent years nearly as well. Uh, there so, seems to be some compromised ability of xylem after the drought, so they can refill these air bubbles. They can force water back through and establish these pipes again. Uh, but it seems that it's perhaps not that effective. Now we start to see some of the, the insects and the fungal pathogens come in. They're not the dominant drivers here, but they do seem to accelerate the decline. Uh, we see a process called cavitation fatigue, which basically means that these uh, pipes are now weaker and able to uh, be embolized at less stressful conditions. So they're, um, they're more vulnerable to water stress in subsequent years. And there's this whole suite of other factors until eventually you get to the point where normal water stress in a non-drought year is the thing that eventually pushes these trees off the edge and you reach death. Um, it's a, it's, we still don't fully understand all of the processes, but we've, we've looked at the various steps uh, and 
what I want to summarize it is, is that we see this accumulated hydraulic impairment, which we uh, suggested as something like hydraulic deterioration, seems to underlie this aspen mortality that happens multiple years, three to nine years after the inciting drought stress. So what does this imply? These two things suggest that one, we need to, we want to broaden the scope out from these stomatal pores to the whole plant strategy. So considering the rooting depths, the allocation, uh, a large suite of, of factors and traits. And it also means that we need to broaden the temporal scale as well, that we care about the conditions before, during, and after the drought, because they'll determine whether the tree can recover, uh, et cetera. And finally, it says there's the possibility for legacy effects, that previous stresses can carry over, and uh, thus our ecosystem response can be contingent upon this set of uh, accumulated effects. So let's talk about prediction now. Uh, what we found was, in, in the case of Aspen anyway, if you know something about the native conductivity, so how well a, a given tree can, can move water through its branches and leaves, you have some chance of predicting, a, a reasonable chance of predicting whether you're going to live or die the next year. So these are the trees that died the next year, and these are the trees that lived the next year with a, a fairly simple logistic relationship. Uh, we saw this as well in some of our, our other experiments we've done in, in pinion and, and juniper. And with Aspen, what we decided to do then was to go out across the landscape and uh, try to correlate drought stress with this hydraulic capacity. So this is, again, hydraulic conductivity here. And we turned to a hydrological model that's, that's uh, simulating the rainfall and the water loss from a, a given grid cell. Uh, and we're in particular using this drought variable called climatic water deficit. Um, it, the way to think of it is how much water would a tree use if it could use as much as it wanted. So uh, it's, it's the difference between what it would use and what it can actually use is the deficit. So higher numbers means more drought stress. And what we found was there did seem to be some sort of crash as a function of drought stress. So as this accumulated drought stress um, over this decade increased, there was this crash after which the hydraulic capacity cratered. Now what's interesting about this is we also have satellite measurements of mortality in this region. This is in the San Juan National Forest in Colorado, in southwestern Colorado. And this same threshold here, this, this break point uh, that we, we find with a, a standard segmented regression analysis, really predicts where mortality ramps up non-linearly across the landscape. So that's, that's really neat. This, this plant hydraulic threshold of, uh, in hydrological drought really matches where mortality ramps up. And so then if we, we go back and say, let's, let's run our model for that early 2000s drought and predict what we think should have lived and died, and then compare it to the satellites of what actually lived and died. And this is what you see. So yellow is, is healthy aspen trees. Uh, red is areas with 50% mortality or more. Uh, and Here's the satellite estimates, and here's what our model predicts. And we do fairly well. We have about 75% spatial accuracy. Uh, what's exciting is we get both the elevation patterns, so we predict mortality at low elevations uh, where it actually occurred, and the slope and aspect patterns. We predict it on south-facing slopes and, and west-facing slopes, and that's indeed what the satellite sees. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. What we can do then is, is take this drought metric and drive this hydrological variable with climate models going forward into the future. Uh, and just focusing here on the, the graph on the right, you can see that the, this drought metric, this decadal climatic water deficit, in the high emission scenario increases across all the models over the 21st century. And in fact, all of the models do cross this mortality threshold uh, for the average aspen pixel uh, that we saw from the early 2000s drought. So that, that's strongly indicative of more mortality and more stress. Uh, certainly worth noting is that the low emission scenario, actually some of the models don't seem to cross this early 2000s threshold. Uh, so that's yet another indicator of how much human decisions uh, to address climate change can really affect how much stress and, and likely how much mortality uh, we think force, at least here Aspen Force, are likely to face. Now, uh, I do think it's worth emphasizing, though, that uh, we're currently still quite a long ways from quantitative predictions of mortality. Um, you might have seen so there have been some high, high uh, visibility papers recently 
uh, in essence, kind of claiming that all southwestern forests are likely to experience 100% tree mortality in the coming century. This is four of these ecosystem models, and in essence, all of the pinion and juniper models uh, hit 100% mortality this century. Certainly, I think more mortality is in the pipeline, but I would, I, I would take these quantitative predictions of mortality with a very heavy uh, grain of salt. Uh, and one reason why is we actually were curious if some of their models could predict the early 2000s drought. Uh, it's something that this group didn't do. And when we compare it to the US Forest Service inventory and analysis, um, at least for one of their major models, it doesn't predict the observed drought patterns um, or magnitude at all. So I think there's, unfortunately, we, we need to, this is a good motivating step, and we need to uh, really attempt studies like this, but we're quite a bit, we're still a long ways, I would say, from believable mortality predictions at regional scales. Uh, now, the, the final set of prediction that I want to talk about is, let's come back now to which trees seem to die more uh, or less during a given drought. And we wanted to know, can plant traits, so a, a, a piece of a plant that you can measure, something like its, its leaf area or its rooting depth or its stomatal strategy, how well can those predict a mortality risk? Um, this is the southwestern Rockies, and you can see there's definitely tree mortality of a lot of different species here uh, in our picture. And so we went to the literature and, and conducted a meta-analysis. We looked for all the instances of drought and temperature-driven tree mortality where more than one species died at once. We found 33 studies uh, spanning 475 species. And what was key was it had to have a community that had more than one species present and report those mortality rates. Uh, so we calculated the relative mortality risk of a species at a given site or region. So in a, in a given site, who dies at a higher rate and who dies at a lower rate uh, during or following the drought. And then we, using meta-analysis statistical techniques, compared this to some of the broad classifications. Do you see higher mortality risk for gymnosperms or angiosperms? Do you see it higher for deciduous or evergreen trees? And then looking at our, our three big categories of xylem anatomy, do you see it higher in conifers, uh, diffuse porous trees, which are like cottonwoods or aspens, or ring porous trees, which tend to be more like your oak trees? And then we compared it to some of the physiological traits. So this comes back now to these drought response strategies. We, we had traits that quantified uh, some of the stomatal strategy and how early it closes, the xylem vulnerability, wood density. There's, there's a suite of these. Uh, now, before I get to the, the results, I want to quickly uh, just give you an overview of, of two of the traits that did seem to matter quite a lot. And these are estimates of the xylem vulnerability to embolism, this process, right, where these air bubbles interrupt this water transport. Uh, this is what's called a vulnerability curve, and as you move from right to left, this is more water stress. So the, uh, the water potentials are falling, that's higher and higher tension, and of course this percent loss conductivity, how well the branches can move water, falls. There tends to be a kind of a sigmoidal increase that at moderate water stress, there's not much loss in the xylem piping of water, there's this nonlinear increase, and then you plateau out at, at completely blocked by air. Now, one of the, the main traits that the physiologists measure is the 50% loss point. So at what, at what water potential here, at what level of, of drought stress, do we see that 50% loss point? It's a, a good way of uh, calibrating where this curve is. Uh, a, a good example is a, a cottonwood that will be certainly at much lower stresses than, say, a, a juniper. These will differ quite a lot. And then the second trait that is really interesting is, is called the hydraulic safety margin. Uh, so this actually ties into this um, planetary boundary sense a little bit in that if we identify some sort of threshold, here we'll say the 50% loss point, the safety margin is how close do you get to that threshold uh, in, in relatively uh, average or moderately stressful conditions. So if this is the water potential here that a plant gets on a, a dry season but not a severe drought, the difference between these two is the safety margin. Uh, you can think of this as, as on a, a whole plant scale, plants with a large safety margin are taking a fairly cautious strategy towards drought and plants with a, a very tiny or even a negative margin are, are a lot more risk seeking. 
Now, what we found first was that the large classifications of trees had relatively little ability um, to predict mortality risk. That is, we didn't see differential mortality between angiosperms and gymnosperms across the world. Uh, there was a slight increase in, in your risk of mortality for being diffuse porous, uh, significant in some of the models and not some of the others. And deciduous and evergreen were also um, really no signal in, in mortality risk. Now, if we look at the physiology, however, we did see a couple of, of traits of species biology that mattered. We, we saw that this, this P50 point was, was predictive of mortality, that if you had a less negative P50 point, so that means a, a really weak tree, a drought weak tree, you are likely to experience higher mortality rates. And this hydraulic safety margin also had a predictive ability, that if you had larger safety margins, so you're more cautious during drought, you're at a lower mortality risk. Now, uh, this, is, this is exciting news. This speaks a little bit to the whole plant drought strategies that we might need to quantify and, and try to model across landscapes. Uh, but one, one uh, caveat to keep in mind here is that even uh, with our, our best model, our model that includes all of the predictive traits, we're still only able to explain about 27 to 30% of the variability in mortality risk. Uh, so there's, there's certainly a long way to go and a lot of unexplained factors that, that we need to try to dig into here uh, as well. So talk a little bit about where I see some of the promising ways headed forward in, in predicting drought-induced tree mortality, uh, some of which has been there's been a, a rapid development in these hydraulic models. So this is models of a single tree or a stand of trees that pipe water from the soil up to the leaves. And they do it, this is a, there's no need to worry about all these figures, but they do it in, in sort of an electrical resistance type model that you have uh, a resistance of water from moving all the way up and that this is related to a whole set of, of species traits. Uh, things like the P50 that I just told you about, uh, stomata, and um, it also is, is nice because you can start to tack in some of the other pieces of biology that we really think should matter. The allocation, like how many leaves per roots or how many leaves per basal area you, you have. Um, I think there's going to be a, a, a lot of insight gained by incorporating in a couple other processes. So in particular, the, the variation within a species of these traits. So as you go from, say, a dry to the wet edge of a species range or from the bottom to the top of a mountain where a species is found. Uh, and also it's, it's really clear, and I think this is where some of that um, previous study that I'm skeptical of uh, was missing, it's really clear that a lot of the hydrology in soils, uh, both locally and regionally, will have a pretty large effect on who's likely to be at risk for mortality. Uh, we've been working on this in putting in this, this uh, hydraulic model into a land surface model. So these are the large scale models that, that uh, coupled directly to climate models and can be run at, at regional or, or even global scales. Uh, and what's, what's really exciting here is that we can simulate the physiology of drought stress, so this hydraulic transport uh, and stressful uh, conditions that cause loss in, in hydraulic condu conductance. And we can also simulate a lot of the other processes that we think matter. So we can have plants, uh, this in particular does a, a version of a forest um, gap emulator or a stand emulator. So it's actually allow cohorts of trees to compete for light and water and resources, shade each other out, uh, and really incorporate in a lot of the other processes uh, across the landscape that we think should matter, fire regimes, hydrology, soils. Uh, so we've been building this in and, and are getting ready to start running some simulations in the western US. And then I, I think obviously a, a big call is to, to really try to link in a lot of the other stressors that are going to be affecting trees at the same time and sometimes as a consequence of drought. So the really complex interactions between pests and pathogens in trees uh, and these kind of cross-scale interactions uh, as well. So this is uh, uh, an attempt we, we did for a, just a kind of a theoretical model in linking bark beetle populations and tree physiology. Uh, other folks have been working on this as well, and I, I think we're uh, moving towards a, a predictive way to try to bring in these other stressors uh, in our models. So uh, just for the, the big picture summary, we know that tree mortality is occurring around the world and has all these consequences uh, that we care about. 
mortality is this, this complex cascade of processes, but it does seem to be um, to strongly involve this loss of hydraulic transport. This is our, our way into uh, trying to understand the physiology and make predictions in the future. And I, I think it's possible to, to start making predictions in the near term, uh, but we need a lot of careful attention to the, to, to the various factors that are going to determine mortality before we can have a lot of regional confidence uh, in the predictions of, of who's at risk uh, and where and why. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take a few questions and thank you all for coming. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So what are, what are the next steps for the stands that have died? Uh, with, so with Aspen specifically, um, being a clonal tree, this root network, of course, matters a lot. And what we're seeing is that in these drought areas, the root network seems to die off at roughly the same rate as the canopy, uh, which means by the time you hit 50, 60% loss of the, the biomass or uh, the stems in the stand, there seems to be very, very little regeneration. Um, some of our, our early estimates from some demographic models is that these stands won't replace themselves uh, with those low regeneration rates. Uh, what this does su suggest, and I, I think um, Wayne Shepard and a few other people have been, have been doing some experiments on this, is that possibly early intervention with Aspen might actually be able to trigger uh, regeneration and restoration. So this is uh, doing some sort of management treatment before 50% uh, or 30% or of that root network is lost. Uh, I, I think there's one study so far showing that if you, if you do these managements early, you might be able to actually trigger that root network to restore itself. Uh, in the long run, some of these stands are headed towards either meadows or ponderosa pine forests. Uh, we, we see no signs of the, the forests we're studying uh, regenerating, and actually the, uh, in southwest Colorado, they did come in and try to log some of it, but it was about eight to 10 years later, uh, where you had 70 to 80% mortality, and in essence, there's, there's really nothing coming back. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the, the question was how tree age might play into this hydraulic transport of water. Uh, it certainly will matter quite a lot. And we, fortunately, I think the, it has a lot more to do with size uh, of the tree and, and uh, the allometry, particularly the leaf area relative to the, the sapwood area and the root area. Uh, those have huge leverage on both how much water gets moved and how vulnerable it is to drought. So uh, from kind of a, a first principle standpoint, it'll have a big difference uh, between, say, the vulnerability of like a seedling or a, a, a sucker versus an, an actual mature tree. Um, the, so there, it, does, it does matter quite a lot. It's likely that these larger trees are, are more vulnerable uh, due to the, uh, a lot having to do with the allometry, uh, but that's still, there's still a lot more that we need to understand there. Um, fortunately, we can measure all these things, right? So the, the nice part is you don't have to necessarily know the age because it really seems to be the size and the allometries that, that dictate this water transport. Yeah. Sure. The, are you interested in the techniques for, say, the, the water transport hydraulic conductivity? Yeah, absolutely. So the way, the way you measure this in the field, uh, you can measure it on a whole tree if you, if you have sap flow probes and you know the water stress at the top. You can, you can calculate the ability of water to move up. But the, the more um, 
direct and commonplace metric is actually to collect a branch or a, a stem segment uh, to keep it hydrated and bring it back to the lab and then you actually just force water through it uh, either with a, a pressure head or a, a vacuum on the other end uh, and it's a really a pretty simple and elegant technique you, you say attach a, a vacuum to one end and you have water connected to a scale and a computer on the other end and you can just measure the rate at which water gets sucked through the branch. Uh, that, that gives you a metric of the, the native conductivity, so how well uh, just a, a branch that you shot down from a tree works in the field. And then you can actually put it under uh, a, a much higher vacuum and suck out all of those air bubbles blocking the xylem and measure it again. And that tells you the percent loss. So those are the, the two main ways that folks do it, is you, you collect that branch sample and, and measure that in the lab.